Hello, I'm Mirbat al Asnaj with Khalid al Shaibi, day three at the ESC Congress here in Madrid. A lot of hotlines today in late breaking trials. Um, perhaps I'll start with the first one, the Pulse trial. So, this was really an interesting design. This was a CT based trial that looked at patients who had undergone high risk PCI of the left main coronary artery. And these patients were assigned to either standard of care, where evaluation was based, was ischemia driven and symptom driven. Or routinely at six months, a CT scan was conducted in these patients. Now, the randomization was one-to-one, -one, and um, the those who were standard of care received at the discretion of the uh, enrolling physician the guideline-directed uh, therapy. So for those who underwent a CT and instantary stenosis was detected, they underwent invasive angiography and treated accordingly. If they found disease in other arteries, they were treated accordingly as well. Uh, it was a bit vague whether that accordingly as well as per guidelines, whether that was stenting or optimizing guideline-directed medical therapy. And interestingly, the primary endpoint was really a composite of all-cause death, spontaneous MI, unstable angina, stent thrombosis, whether probable or definite, at 18 months. They actually enrolled 600 patients in this. The mean age was about 69, and uh, women were about 18%. 89% of those who were enrolled actually ended up getting the CT as planned, and the follow-up median was about 200 days. So the primary endpoint event occurred at 11.9% in the CT arm and 12.5% in the standard of care arm. So we really didn't reach uh, statistical significance. There was no significant difference. But the CT arm, they did find that they had a reduction in the risk of spontaneous myocardial infarctions, where it was 0.9% versus 4.9%. So quite significant difference between the two. Um, there was also an increase in imaging triggered, so CT triggered really, um, target lesion revascularization in the CT arm compared with those who were in, assigned to the control arm, 4.9% versus 0.3%. Again, that was significant. So at six months, routine CT scan for patients who had undergone left main PCI, it didn't reduce any of the hard endpoints in terms of death, stent thrombosis, etc. But we do see a reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarctions, which probably warrants or is really aligned with complete revascularization that we know about uh, from other studies, but probably warrants further evaluation on what kind of treatment these patients actually re received in order for them to have a reduction in this endpoint. I'd really like to see the, the full paper, obviously, because as you mentioned, uh, there was no difference in ischemia-driven target vessel revascularization in these patients, but there was clearly obviously, more uh, image-guided revascularization because those who underwent uh, invasive coronary artery based on the recommendation of the CT, if restenosis was found, they underwent the procedure. So I really would want to see how this was broken down in the paper. Can we assume that the reduction in spontaneous MIs was seen in favor of the CT group was due to this uh, treatment of asymptomatic restenosis was detected early? I don't know. I mean, it's confusing to read. Yeah, it would be difficult to tell. But I mean, part of it is the revascularization that they end up undergoing for the non-culprit uh, or the incidentally discovered stenosis. And perhaps part of it is optimization of guideline-directed medical therapy and intensifying risk factors. We don't really know that. Again, oh. the devil's in the detail. Exactly. But I know you had another trial that you looked into for us today, the option trial, Fadid. Do you want to yeah. us about that? The option STEMI trial. This was a... Uh, uh, investigated, initiated trial in Korea in 14 centers, and it addressed the question of, we all know that complete revascularization is clearly indicating persons who present with uh, a STEMI. Uh, the question is, though, do you do it immediately or at one time at the index procedure, or is or can you defer it? And generally, a lot of people's practices defer the procedure, and they wanted to see whether an upfront, immediate complete revascularization during the index procedure was non-inferior to a delayed strategy. And here, the delayed strategy was also finite. The patients that were randomized to the delayed strategy all had complete revascularization within the index hospitalization. In fact, the those that had complete immediate revascularization spent four, an average of four days in the hospital was those that had a delayed revascularization st uh, strategy spent five days in the hospital. So it was different from other 
deferral strategy in which complete revascularization could be done up to four to six weeks uh, down the road. The primary endpoint was uh, all-cause death, non-fatal MI, uh, and unplanned revascularization at one year. A total of just, uh, just under 1,000 patients were randomized. Mean age was 66. 79% of them were men. And interestingly, one-third of these patients uh, had heart failure at randomization. At one year, the primary endpoint of death, MI, and planned re unplanned revascularization occurred to 13% of the immediate complete revascularization group and 10.8% in, in the staged group. So, in fact, the uh, point hazard ratio was 1.2 for the 1.24 with a confidence in, uh, interval of 0.86 to 1.79. Hence, the non-inferiority uh, was not uh, was not achieved. Uh, although they did do a pre-specified subgroup analysis, which showed there was some heterogeneity in treatment effect, and there was a clear signal that patients who had immediate complete revascularization, who had killer plus two to three heart failure, seemed to do worse. So there may be a uh, we, the, something that I took away from this is maybe complete revascularization is okay during the index procedure, provided your patient is not in heart failure, in which case it may be better to defer it. Yeah, it was quite interesting. The investigators did do a subgroup analysis on the based on the killer classification, but they didn't really look into the complexity of the PCI itself and the syntax score of these patients. And I think that is definitely a factor as operators we look into when we make a decision whether we want to revascularize immediately or stage it and it's no longer an ad hoc PCI. If we, uh... We're commentating on the hotline sessions. Again, as you said, the devil's in the details. It'll be really interesting to read the whole paper and see if any of these details are uh, elucidated. Yeah. So the next trial that I actually looked into and I'm glad was presented because at least, um, you know, it sheds light on a very controversial topic, which is the use of drug-coated balloons in peripheral vascular disease. So this was the SWEDE PAD-1 and SWEDE PAD-2 uh, trials. These were similar trials. They were all conducted. They were both conducted in Sweden, obviously, 22 different sites. And they took patients in Swede 1, over 2,300 patients who had advanced peripheral vascular disease, that is Rutherford class 4 to 6. And they were randomized to drug-coated balloons for infrainguinal disease versus regular non-coated balloons and stents. And then they followed them up with one-to-one -one randomization, and they followed them up. About 99% did receive the paclitaxel, was the drug that was used in this uh, trial. There was no difference in the primary endpoint here of time from the revascularization to above-ankle amputation in these patients. Um, the hazard ratio here was 1.05 with a uh, reasonable uh, confidence interval. The target vessel reinterventions were reduced in the drug coated arm during the first year, but that actually waned subsequently and it disappeared completely with longer follow up of these patients. And there was no difference in the hard endpoints of all cause mortality and quality of life, unfortunately. Now, when we look at Swede PAD2, this was a trial again that enrolled more than 2,100 patients, but this was patients with not very advanced peripheral vascular disease. These were Rutherford class 1 to 3. And again, they underwent one to one randomization, drug coated, primarily paclitaxel versus uh, non drug coated balloon angioplasty or stenting. And again, there was no difference in the primary efficacy endpoint of quality of life between the two strategies. The target vessel re-intervention rate was also not different at one year. And likewise, when they continued to follow them up further, up to six years even. The all-cause mortality, again, did not differ. So unfortunately for these patients who are um, early stage peripheral vascular disease, there was no real difference between drug-coated versus not drug-coated. However, they did notice a signal towards a higher five-year mortality in these patients who received the drug coated. And so this is a signal that perhaps warrants more investigation in light of the previous trials. Paclitaxel. The paclitaxel uh, drug coated balloons. Another trial, very important, that we discussed very extensively this morning, Khaled, the aquatic trial. The aquatic trial. Now, this was an interesting one. It addresses a common problem. This was a French, again, uh, investigator initiated the trial uh, that aimed to answer the question of in patients who are oral anticoagulation primarily for atrial fibrillation who had undergone high uh, 
I will also consider it at high risk from thro for thrombotic events had they undergone PCI at least six months earlier. For either an acute coronary syndrome, about 70% of the patients, the, the indication for their uh, PCI was an acute coronary syndrome or had other high-risk features if this was a non-ACS intervention, such as diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and so forth. So that all these patients had completed six months on DAPT and, uh, and oral anticoagulation. At six months, they dropped the aspirin in one group and continued the aspirin with oral anticoagulation. Again, oral anticoagulation was primarily for atrial fibrillation, and in most of these patients, it's one on NOAC. So they compared outcomes in two groups, NOAC only or NOAC plus aspirin after you had already completed six months uh, out from your uh, index procedure. Patients were randomized one to one. The primary efficacy, they had two, two endpoints, a efficacy endpoint and a safety endpoint. The efficacy endpoint was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, systemic embolism, coronary revascularization, acute limb ischemia. The secondary endpoint was obviously was major bleeding. Interestingly, though, this study was stopped early on the advice of the safe, inter, independent data and safety uh, board. monitoring board after two years due to an excess in all-cause mortality in the aspirin group. Again, this the, the, the increase in mortality and obviously also an increase in bleeding. So this, uh, I think, is a, an important study that uh, really shows that uh, in this subset of patients who are who have atrial fibrillation uh, and therefore have a very clear indication for oral anticoagulation, have undergone a PCI, uh, that continuing aspirin beyond six months is probably not the thing we should be doing and probably we should be dropping aspirin after six months and just continuing on the NOAC in this group of patients. Yeah. And it seems that the majority of the patients received NOAC, NOAC rather than yeah. KA. I think uh, they said 10%, 10 or 20% were uh, warfarin. The uh, vast majority were NOACs, yes. And it was primarily most of the uh, indications for anticoagulation in these patients was atrial fibrillation. I believe this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine as a s simultaneous publication. And again, the authors um, reference that the appendix probably has a little more detail on the index procedure that was done. Uh, w and what kind of antiplatelet P2Y12 inhibitors. And maybe we can tease out there if that early antiplatelet regimen had any impact subsequently in this patient suffering. Exactly. And another thing is, that, uh, and they actually discussed this as well, was in fact, you would think to recruit for this study would be easy. But in fact, they had a lot of difficulty in recruiting for this study because of many of the uh, physicians, the interventionalists, were very reluctant to have their patients enrolled because, you know, you ha we have this mindset, okay, I've just done a very complex procedure here. Uh, I don't want them to drop uh, drop the aspirin and the DAPT. So they actually did have difficulty recruiting and therefore the study went on for a lot longer as recruitment was being uh, pursued. Therefore, they had a lot of events accrue and it ended up, the, the safety monitoring board ended the study prematurely because of the excess mortality in the aspirin group. And speaking of difficult to recruit trials, the um, DAPT shock trial was an important trial that evaluated the efficacy and safety of antiplatelet regimens in patients who are presenting with cardiogenic shock related to acute myocardial infarction. Interestingly, though, they managed to actually at the end get over 600 patients from 29 different hospitals in five European countries enrolled. Um, there was a primary laboratory uh, where they looked at the um, platelet reactivation index, and this clearly showed a better reduction and a better index, a better inhibition, I'm sorry, and a better index with Cangrelor versus Ticagrelor, and it appeared quite early on. There was a primary clinical endpoint where it included death, a composite of death, MI, ischemic stroke at 30 days, and it occurred in 37.6% of those on Cangrelor and 41% of those in the Ticagrelor group, so non-inferior for cardiovascular death and all-cause death. Secondary endpoints, superior for reinfarction and stent thrombosis. Safety in terms of bleeding, BARC3, uh, and more, no difference between Cangrelor and Ticagrelor. So really, people like me who practice in an area where Cangrelor still hasn't made it, 
um, is something to keep in the back of our minds. But again, keeping on with what you and I have been saying all afternoon right now is the devil is in the detail. Cardiogenic shock patients are not all managed the same. Um, and it'd be interesting to see bleeding events and ischemic events, how they play out in patients who received, for example, mechanical circulatory support devices as opposed to those who did not, and so on. I think still discussing antiplatelets, a very interesting trial, the uh, neo mindset, how, how it was presented. Yeah, well, again, going along with the, the current trend in trying to minimize. Uh, durational level of antiplatelet inhibition to reduce bleeding com complications. This study aimed to uh, answer the question whether a upfront uh, P2Y12 regimen without aspirin was non-inferior to uh, traditional DAPT-based regimens. So 3,400 patients were randomized in 50 centers uh, one was randomized to uh, a P the the posted P2Y12 inhibitors 70% of the 60% of the time. I mean, it was uh, I believe uh, prasugrel 70% of the time it was prasugrel and 30% of the time it was ticagrelor versus conventional DAPT. So uh, no aspirin versus conventional DAPT. Uh, again, 70% were men and 30% were women. Uh, the ACS was six uh, was 60% of the time a STEMI. Now, the primary ischemic end, there are two endpoints again, an ischemic endpoint and a bleeding endpoint. The ischemic endpoint was all as a composite of all-cause death, MI stroke, and urgent target vessel revascularization. That occurred in 7% of the monotherapy group and in 5.5% of the dual antiplatelet therapy. So again, non-inferiority, unfortunately, was not met. So aspirin, at least up front, is with us to stay here. Uh, bleeding was reduced in the monotherapy group, obviously, but the, again, uh, given the, the non-inferiority was not met for the primary ischemic endpoint, I think uh, this study really does show that, uh, at least initially, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is required. Uh, we can't drop it right from this, uh, the get-go. You know, I found another trial quite interesting and relevant to our practice where we're getting more complex cases coming to the cath lab. It's called the tailored chip. So this looked at tailored versus conventional antithrombotic regimens or strategies intended for complex high-risk PCI. Um, it was multi-center, investigator-initiated, open-label, and interestingly, they looked at a superiority design here. So they looked at low-dose ticagrelor plus aspirin for zero to six months, followed by clopidogrel alone for six to 12 months, so a late de-escalation sort of regimen, versus clopidogrel and aspirin for the entire 12 months. And the primary endpoint was really a net adverse clinical event, and it was a composite of death from any cause, MI, stroke, stent thrombosis, or urgent revascularization and clinically driven bleeding at one year. So it occurred in the tailored at 10.5 and conventional 8.8. .8. Uh, unfortunately, it did not meet um, the superiority criteria, so it did not seem to provide a net clinical benefit in these patients. When we look at secondary endpoints, ischemic events, there was no difference. Bleeding events higher with the tailored, interestingly. So this actually challenges the notion that more is better, even in carefully selected patients who are at high ischemic risk undergoing percutaneous revascularization. Um, and standard 12-month regimen for now seems appropriate. This is quite in distinction to what we just mentioned uh, a few moments ago. But I think, it, you know, it sets the platform for us to discuss what should be the ideal duration and intensity of antithrombotics in these patients. So thank you, everybody, for joining us on day three. It's a lot of data there to digest, but I'm sure once the uh, articles are simultaneously published, it'll be much easier to tease out all the details. And we'll see you for the final day in just 24 hours.